the history of the world backwards. What does it look like? What does it let us see? Previously on the history of the world backwards, we saw direct action against climate criminals achieve critical mass. My husband and I have great pleasure in declaring air travel would not be possible. We felt the pain of geneticists Watson and Crick as with every day they got further and further away from understanding the secret workings of hereditary genetic characteristics. All right, the way it works is like this. If you were bad in a past life, then two generations later, you might come back again. Only this time, you'd be mental. We have borne witness to the ever greater proportion of humanity farming and growing, slowly and patiently acquiring the skills of tilling the soil, irrigation, drainage, husbandry, and nitrogen fixing. The ever greater number in farming and growing has even seen Dr. Sigmund Freud diversify his business. You get 15 minutes with me on your doorstep. How you use that time is up to you. Psychotherapy or vegetables. of the world backwards, time flows forwards. It is only history that is in reverse. So, for example, in 1907, an old woman soldering a steel panel to the bottom of a burnt-out kettle fails to convince her grandchildren that when she was a teenager in the 1990s, she'd have just thrown the kettle away and got a new one from China. No one fixed anything then, and no one knew anything back then. But the 20th century has seen a steady accumulation of knowledge. She can cobble shoes, darn socks, and remove the copper filament from an Xbox and Atari sequencer. She knows when to plant crops and how to fake identity cards. However, she would trade it all for a local anaesthetic at the dentist's. Spring green, rhubarb, courgettes, tomato, a rainbow chard and fennel. So, I've been bitterly regretting this relationship from about ten years ago. This is a woman I hadn't even thought about for three years until I saw her. The regret, it's lacerating. And then maybe that's what it's for, you know, the punishment. Finding a stick to beat myself with. Oh, and apples. But perhaps it's more than just self-laceration, more than just beating myself up over her. Maybe the pain I feel about her has got nothing to do with her, but is a much older pain to do with... I don't know. What sort of apples? Dr. Freud later visits another patient of his, a young man called Antoine, who has been driven to nervous exhaustion by his landlord and landlady, the Lavenders, who are kind, innocent, dear, sweet people, but whenever they talk, they sound sinister. What have you been doing? Oh, my wife Elaine came to visit with our two children, and we went to the park with the slide and the climbing frame and swings, and. They're still toddlers still, so, you know, it's, uh, you have to keep your eye on them all the time. You never know what they're going to bump into. <laughs> yes. It would be a shame if one of your children were to have some kind of accident. In the history of the world backwards, the last months of television became a frenetic scramble. Failing broadcast technology led to less and less hours of airtime. As advertising space became narrower, advertisers piggybacked each other's slots until in the end, it was just one heroic celebrity doing every product in one live commercial break. Yummy, deliciously crunchy. 
Tasty. Mmm, fragrant. Who wants to play? Oh, headache. That better. Toys. A knife. Tangy. Four blades. Oh, no. It's coming off already. On the 6th of March, 1957, in the former Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah completes his vision of pan-African rationalization by outsourcing control of his country to the British. Nkrumah persuades his people that best practice in the globalized world is to dispense with petty nationalism and outsource administrative and trade responsibilities to the city of London. The British have now changed the name of our country to give us a new launch on the international scene. I assure you, the British have no plans to asset strip our raw materials and that their decision to rename our country the Gold Coast in no way reflects an attitude of plunder. Nkrumah has not long been president of the Gold Coast when a coup is mounted by generals who want to turn the clock back to the bad old days of Ghanaian independence. Luckily, the coup is defeated by Anglo-Ghanaian saboteurs deploying tactics learnt in Britain. After the 60s, at the beginning of the 50s, white Europeans forget how to dance. Trinidadians, Barbadians, Greeks, Brazilians and Jamaicans are all emigrating. As they leave, anxious whites follow them down to the harbour, to the very gangplank of the Windrush, begging to be shown the dance steps just once more. But still smarting from the no dogs, no Irish, no black signs, which have just begun to appear in the front windows of Ladbroke Grove and Toxteth B&Bs, the emigrants refuse. The Windrush is a Greek-owned ship, and as the whites stand on the quay, a Greek falls in the water. Watching him drown, the Saxons think they're being shown dance moves. And so for the next 20 years, white people dance like this. In 1979, the government, looking to plug the £40 billion pensions black hole, sets a target to have 90% of the population smoking by 1940. Through the 70s, 60s and 50s, mandatory smoking is introduced on tube platforms, escalators, train carriages, buses, the underground, planes, cinemas and classrooms. <laughs> Sorry ladies, I was looking for the gents. Might it not be that the leaders do not take things seriously enough? That they are not a hard, serious people? I mean, why should they be? For after a lifetime of privilege, ease and seclusion, might it not have become difficult for them to approach pretentious developments with due gravity? How many of all the problems that came from the Yalta Conference was due to Connecticut aristocrat and United States President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's predilection for dressing up? And what does Roosevelt say to the prospect of Soviet influence over the Dardanelles? I am Dracul. This Roosevelt I know not. I am Dracul. Here the three great leaders at Yalta can be seen in a last ditch attempt to use diplomacy and the power of face-to-face -face communication to stave off the threat of world war. Humanity's fate rests with the weighty deliberations about the balance of world power which these statesmen negotiate. You wish you lived in the old days of eye technology then, Jeremiah? Well, your science paint never solved one problem, but it created ten more. Your planes flying in the sky 200 years ago led to the Blitz, 1940s. Blitz? What was the Blitz? Well now, the Blitz on London was a mutual pact agreed with Germany to stimulate property development. Britain wanted to get rid of Coventry, you see. 
but they couldn't just flatten it themselves without there being an uprising of outraged local residents, so they needed a foreign power to obliterate it for them. Germany, meanwhile, had hopes to transform Dresden, that expensive relic of the bygone high-tech era, into a more homely, cobbly sort of a place, so they asked the RAF to flatten that one. Were these nuclear bombs, eh? No, no nuclear bombs since 1945. Oh, eh? What happened then? Alarmed by the imminent outbreak of war, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer hatched a plan with Major Etherley, pilot of the Enola Gay, named after the orchestral manoeuvres in the Dark Song. Late one night, the two men snuck into an air hangar and tiptoed past all the other bomber planes. The Tainted Love, the Don't You Want Me Baby, the Hungry Like a Wolf, the Blue Monday. And then they gets to the Love Shack and Rock Lobster, which are the B-52s. And when they arrive at the Enola Gay, the two men secretly removed uranium from all the missiles primed for use against the civilian Volk of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As war rages, people find escape from care and woe through the magic of the silver screen. It is a golden age of Hollywood cinema. After the strictures of the McCarthyite 50s, a new liberality flourishes in the 1940s. In The Searchers, John Wayne stars as a gay cowboy who rides in to save a small town plagued by poor interior design. The film charts his struggle to establish a monthly hardhouse techno night. John Wayne is, however, just one of the many successful actors of the talkies era who struggled to make the transition to silent films which become popular in the 30s and 20s. Silent films are a product of the Great Depression, during which depression no one feels like talking. Even the silent film caption writers became depressed, although at first they seemed to be getting on with their work just the same as ever. Thermodynamics holds that all technological inventions are part of the slope of time with the handbrake off and the crumbling brick underneath the wheel. Each day I get an emergency call out to the scene where a familiar piece of technology has begun to fail. I rush to Fleming's laboratory where the last batch of penicillin is going off. I can think of nothing to arrest the process as it turns into live yogurt before my very eyes. Alexander Graham Bell, through heroic work, has managed to get the telephone working again years after it had collapsed and been given up on by the world. And he was even able to prove the success by giving a public demonstration of a properly functioning telephone. Are you receiving? Hello! Tell me, madam, what are you wearing? Are you really? She says she's touching herself. Where? Between the legs. She says she's touching herself between the legs. Hard and sticky. You push the crotch of your panties where? To one side. To what purpose? I see. Hot and sticky, you say. Me? I I'm wearing a suit. Why do you ask? every loss there is a gain, with every gain there is a loss. In the history of the world backwards, their concerns about population are the opposite of ours. Their worry is that population goes down year on year. 
their fears are of ever falling human numbers. But with that decline comes benefits in housing, in landscape, and in food production. Those humans who have survived the population collapse of the 20th century are those with a happy genetic tolerance to BSE infected meat and recombinant bovine growth hormone. And so man is once more at one with nature as ranchers drive herds of infected cattle across the American plain. Working again. Alas, no, that's quite impossible. There's no electrical energy, no power source. Right. None at all. Right. Well, these investigations we shall have to postpone, for I have lobbied the Pope about how vital your work is in stemming technology collapse and in understanding what the inventions of the past were used for. But he wants to see the good work for himself. In one hour, the Pope shall be here and will pronounce on whether to renew your research licence or not. I go to fetch him now. And I to escort you. I expect the floor swept and buffed. Uh, the, the Pope has expressed interest into my inquiry into a swizzle sting. Solving the mysteries of the past is wonderful. Fear not, Duchess of Padua, I am the Pope and I am infallible. So you may rest assured that whatever I decide, it will be the correct decision. I am the Pope and it is impossible for me to make a mistake. Hat off, I think. I, I meant that. People think I'm blessing them if I lift the hands up, so I've developed a whole new way of doing a lot of things without raising my hands too much. You could probably do a whole science paper studying this new system I've devised. Whoa! Oh. Let's see what you've got under the table. Huh? Yep, that all seems in order. Your Holiness, may I have the honour of introducing to you Galileo and Kepler. Madam, madam. Our work will bring glory and fame to the church, to your holiness, and to our patron, the Duchess of Padua, for I have reconstructed the world's last telescope. The spaceman. Imagine living in that time, Galileo. It is written that 400 years ago, in 1969, something amazing happened. A spacecraft landed on the continent of America in a city called Houston. Three spacemen climbed out and told us that they had come from the moon. The telescope, your holiness, is operated thus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One for use, one for spare. Thank you. Well done, Galileo. You're doing great work. I am never wrong. I'm very happy to grant a renewed research license for both you and Kepler. It's wonderful work you are doing, which will vastly increase the power of the church over her dominions. <gasps> the get me home device. We know that when depressed people thought I can't go on, they would turn to this device. If they thought I can't face going to work or, or going home, this would encourage them, saying, keep going. 
Turn right straight on over the bridge up the hill. You're nearly there. Look, a balloon. The sat nav. That sounds like satellite navigation. Yes, Your Holiness. And with the telescope, I have been tracking the movements of satellites and space stations across the heavens. There are no satellites. Everything in heaven was put there by God. Through God's creation, man in the form of astronaut. Galileo Galilei. For your satin of heresy, you will be burnt at the stake. Your entrails flash fried before your very eyes. Tomorrow. As part of our Make Science History Week. Duchess, my hand. Emmeline Pankhurst leads a campaign to let women stop at home and not have to go to work. She calls a press conference by some railings to prove female ineptitude. Watch me try to padlock my bicycle. Oh, I'm such a useless ninny. But this is what happens when we're allowed to roam free without chaperones or male guidance. Do you see what I mean? Meanwhile, Sylvia Pankhurst leads the suffragette movement for electoral reform. I'll vote in the apple crumble referendum, but anything else is beyond my competency. Gentlemen complain that the new practice of having to hold doors open for women is political correctness gone mad. By 1920, British and French control of the Middle East was giving way to the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which now rules much of the Arab world. In an attempt to ensure the continuance of that harmony between nations which has been such a feature of British control of the Middle East. A year or two before the handover to Turkey, Britain decides to reform the map of the Arab world as a last gesture of goodwill. Foreign Office diplomat Gertrude Bell is commissioned to redraw the borders of the Middle East, in part because she is a keen Arabist, but above all because she is good at art. And so, as a last gift from Britain to the Arab world, a map is given which takes full cognizance of religious sensitivities and is no orientalist template of European devising but an expression of the wishes of the peoples of the Middle East. In Matadi, Bakuba chief Tuam Wei opens an indigenous Congolese conference in the Belgian colony by quoting words first uttered in Britain a hundred years before. We don't want to be ruled from Brussels but all our laws are made in Brussels. We don't mind trading with Europe, but we don't want to be part of Europe. Now, under the European Working Time Directive, if not enough rubber is collected, your village is burnt down and hostages taken until the quota, measured in kilograms, I need hardly add, is achieved. More Brussels madness! Oh dear, oh dear, what has happened here, officer? Firearms incident. And yet somehow the gunman or gunwoman, Muriel, or perhaps both, appear to have got away. Now how, I wonder, did they do that? Well, I suppose most firearms could be hidden in a bag. Why? Hardly much bigger than this one. I do hope there isn't going to be another shooting officer in, say, ten minutes' time. Over there, which is where we are going now. I just wanted to say that I'm very unhappy about last week's session. Oh, really? Yeah. It was only afterwards I realised that you hadn't been thinking about me at all, but only about fruit and vegetables. 
I think that's why I had a dream last night about a cauliflower that had your voice. Has this dream made you want to eat more cauliflowers as a result? No. Even though they are on special? Yeah. Two for one. No, 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 it was more what the voice was saying. So you don't want the cauliflower? No, we're not talking about vegetables. We're talking about psychotherapy. I know we are. You didn't think we were talking about me. You thought we were talking about the vegetables. So when you don't say anything, that means we're talking about psychotherapy? In your dream, I wonder, do you recall what the cauliflower was saying? Um, y yeah, it was um, a, a list of other vegetables. But look, I tell you what, let me just uh, get order my veg box now, you know, get, get the veg out of the way and then we can get back to the dream. No, 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 I'm talking about veg now. We're not on psychotherapy, we're on veg. I know we are. Well, then why are you going so slow? Just waiting to take your order. Isn't that where you make your case notes on our sessions? This isn't about me! It's about vegetables! I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I've got nothing out of this! No joy! No veg! You will die now! Next on the History of the World Backwards, we go from the end of oil into a post-industrial world. As the oil runs out, we will see ruling elites use a dastardly system of exploitation to preserve their energy-intensive lifestyles. But we will also discover how one man's heroic struggle against this evil plan hatched by the powerful barons who control America's energy leads him to rig up the world's last ever secret bugging device. Once I had their words on cylinder, I would then be able to blow the lid off this criminal conspiracy. And the end of electricity means that humans now have manually to stoke the fire, heat the water, boil and scrub the laundry. We shall learn how this development neatly coincides with interesting new scientific evidence about a difference in mental capacity between men and women. What's five and seven? Twelve. Oh, that's marvellous. Well, you should be on the stage in a travelling show. And Rob's back next Tuesday at ten with more Backwards History. Next tonight on BBC Four, Storyville's birthday celebrations continue with a Russian double bill.